Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his top 10 games for 2018, part one. And I hasten to add that part one because here's the deal. It's Christmas Day 2018 and I'll be honest, I have not gotten a chance to get to the table all the really amazing games that have come out over the year, or more to the point, over the last few months. Heck, a whole bunch of them haven't even made it into my house yet. So I cannot in good conscience say this is the 100% definitive best of the year, or at least best of the year in my own personal opinions to Jen's and my taste. But what I can say is... These are 10 absolutely amazing games. Maybe one or two of them might get knocked out. Maybe there'd be a little bit more shuffling, but I just can't say right now. So, for folks who are worried about such things, I suggest coming back to the channel around April or May in 2019, and I'll be doing a follow-up video because hopefully by then I will have had a chance to, uh, you know, take a gander at all the remaining outstanding games that I think have a good shot of clawing their way into the list I'm about to give you. Now, what are all those games? Well, I'm not going to talk about them right now. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can check out this month's Rotto Rambles, which is... Actually, maybe you can't because that is a video that's only for backers of the show. If you want to know more about it, you can just hit that eye up in the top right corner of the screen and click the Help Rotto Runs. Basically, if you support my show, if you enjoy it, every month there is a cool new behind-the-scenes video. And this month it is me going into a lot more depth about the games of 2018. But... All that aside, uh, commercial break over for the channel. Let's, without any further ado, start talking about what I currently consider to be the 10 best games of the year. Starting with number 10, T.O.T. Huacan. Oh my gosh, this thing is fantastic. Such a great combination of mechanisms. Rondell's worker placement, uh, uh, character aging, um, you know, uh, tile laying, uh, you know, unique special powers, so much go worker bumping, so many cool things. There's just so much going on. It is truly a worthy successor to Zulk in the Mayan calendar, you know, from the same designer, same co-designer. And uh, man, Jen and I absolutely adore it. Now that said, uh, it's not higher on the list because I do have one issue with it, which I did talk about in my original video. It's a shame for Jens and my taste that the two-player count, uh, player bumping, worker bumping, doesn't happen more often because I absolutely love it. And I think there would have been a way they could have designed it to make it more commonplace, like I suspect it is at higher player counts. But that's a minor complaint. That is really knitting some picks uh, in what is otherwise an absolutely phenomenal design. You can check out my run-through to find out more about it. In fact, I've done run-throughs for all 10 of the games I'm talking about today. Uh, but as of right now, I do have to say Jen and I super duper adore and would happily play this very second Teotihuacan. And that's my number 10. But now let's talk about number 9. The Rise of Queensdale, which is, was the big legacy game of the year. And if you're a fan of my show, you know my wife and I absolutely love legacy style games. And we really enjoyed this one a lot. Uh, we powered through it back in April when the publisher sent me a pre-production uh, English copy. And uh, we had an absolutely fantastic time. Actually, it's a testament to how compelling the game was because that was when we were literally in the middle of a multi-month international move. We were effectively living on the road and quasi-homeless, um, you know, just going from temporary housing situation to the next temporary housing situation. And yet we still managed to find the time to repeat repeatedly get this game to the table over and over and over again, sometimes several times in a given day, so that we could have the entire experience, and we loved it from start to finish. Now, again, this is a little bit higher on the list because I would not say this was a perfect game. Our main issue was that as sharp as the cool core gameplay in it is, the two-player scaling, once again, was was a bit off repeatedly over and over again. There were so many opportunities to make the game better for two players only. Don't get me wrong, we still enjoyed it. But the other real issue we had is that, um, you know, as you played the game longer and longer, you really kind of got stuck in a certain strategic rut. And because you of choices you had made in the early game, it really kind of forced you to keep reinforcing those choices in later games. And so there wasn't quite as much variety as I would have liked to see, um, you know, unlike the pandemic legacies, where you know, based on the things that can happen from game to game, they can really force you to you know chase after radically different 
objectives and whatnot, we found, you know, once we were on a certain road, we pretty much stayed on that road and rise to Queensdale. But in spite of that weakness, oh, what a road it was. We absolutely adored it. And if there was ever a sequel to come out, we would definitely want to play it more. But um, as it is, I, we have definitely closed the door on Queensdale. Unlike other legacy games that we could continue playing. Uh, you know, we had a great time, but now it's over, but still have to give it props because it was such a great ride. Number nine, the rise of Queensdale. And then number eight, underwater cities, which is, well, you know, I know how much people love Terraforming Mars. Man, there is so much unbridled passion for that game in the uh, board game geek community, and I totally get it. It's a brilliant design. You know, there's so much going on. You can play it so many different times with all the different cards and, you know, chase different strategies and all that. But for me and Jen, Terraforming Mars, it had a couple of things going against it. Um, the main one being that, for our taste, there was just too much needless player conflict where, oh, I'm just literally going to bring an asteroid down on your head to destroy the stuff to slow you down for a few turns. And it's just like, why is that here? Why is that here? Because we so love the core combinatorial engine um, building gameplay that Terraforming Mars has. This is why we are so happy to have Underwater Cities. Because Underwater Cities gives us all of that, all the really deep and rich world building driven by a, a seemingly endless array of cards that can combo in all kinds of really cool, interesting ways and provide really deep, interesting alternate paths to victory every time you play. That is awesome. You know, every time you are looking at a hand of cards, you're like, oh, I want to do all of these. But I can't. I have to focus. Which way am I going to go? What objectives am I going to chase after and all that stuff? So it really does that wonderfully without the need for player conflict because everybody's building their own little personal world instead of a common world. So we really appreciate that. But that aside, the other thing that really makes Underwater Seas special is such a cool fresh twist on worker placement. Uh, because in this game, the workers you place are, are not just some little pawn that forever remains the same as, you know, Ma and Pa and Agricola or, uh, you know, your little caveman in uh, Stone Age. This really twists worker placement on its head because you have a handful of cards you want to play, your cards are your workers. And you have to combine the right cards with the right worker placement slots so you can uh, trigger bonus actions you can do above and beyond the basic. That extra little oomph creates such a cool and compelling worker placement experience that then dovetails so nicely with all the card combo stuff and the world building and everything else. This game is amazing. From Vladimir Suchi, one of my favorite designers of all time, also as an aside, it's a beautiful story. The creation and development of this game because this was put out by a brand new publisher, which is just Vladimir and his family. They raised enough funds. They didn't go the crowdfunding route. They didn't just ask for you know help and support on Kickstarter. They just got the game published by themselves, put it out there, and they are hoping it is successful enough to warrant them um, you know continuing with their new self uh, uh, published uh, brand, which I think is absolutely great. Because again, he's one of the best designers working today. I wish he could quit his day job so he could just give us more games. He could have the same kind of output as uh, Rosenberg or Feld or something like that. And I hope this is the first step towards it. Because it's, like always, like Shipyard, like, um, oh, um... I want to say Last Will Society, or Last Will. Uh, it's a great, great game. My number eight, Underwater Cities. Then we can go on to number seven. This one is a prize. I didn't, I mean, I knew when the first time I played it, I really, really liked it. And, and um, I'd actually played it as solo, and then I've since played it with my wife. And you know, I've, I've played it quite a bit, I because it's such a short, quick, fast, little game. We've been able to find more time to play it, unlike some of these bigger, longer behemoths. What is it? What is it? Stop talking about it. Say what it is. It's Carson City, the card game. Wow! This thing is so amazing. It is so incredibly tense. Uh, there's two halves to this game. An auction to grab cards, and then once you grab those cards, a tiling exercise to try and stitch them together to make the best Carson City you can. These two halves work so nicely. Both of them are so incredibly rich and tense um, and challenging 
trying to evaluate uh, what card out there is the most valuable for you and what do your opponents think is the most valuable, saving your high bidding cards for later, going, you know, using your low bid cards when you know you can get away with it because you're the only one who would want that thing. So why risk a big pay, you know, payout? Uh, but then once you get the cards, the fact that you are not allowed to rotate them, that you must put them in lockstep, really restricts you. Plus, it's a, you have a small building area as well, makes a very challenging tile laying puzzle that we really, really like a lot. Um, <clears throat> but that in those two things in and of itself, you know, might have gotten it on my top 10 or certainly my top 15, but what really pushed it up higher, higher than three fantastic games I just mentioned before, pushing into the number seven slot, is the fact that, well, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm pretty much a two-player gamer. It's just me and my wife all the time. And the number of times, hey, I've already done it in this run-through, that I have complained about, man, I, you know, I wish... Uh, the the higher player count experience could have been replicated better in our lower player count experience. Uh, but it's so often the case that that just doesn't happen. That is two-player, primary couples gamers, we just have to give it... We know we're getting the less compelling version of the game because usually the focus is on bigger player counts where there's more interesting stuff, more random seeds of chaos from other players that you have to track and all of that. Here's the beautiful thing about Cards City, the card game. It does a brilliant, super elegant, very easy to implement, and yet very deep and rich emulation of a third and a fourth player. Uh, and a second player if you're playing solo. It's a great solo game. Uh, and that is so great because now we don't feel like we're missing out playing uh, the two-player experience because we're getting the full four-player experience whenever we play it. That is what truly elevates this and makes it such an awesome game uh, for folks who are looking for like a, just a really crunchy, meaty, tense puzzle of a game that plays super fast and that offers everything that the higher player count would offer at, uh, at couples count. Oh, that is so awesome. It's why it's my number seven, Carson City, the card game. Like I said, that was a bit of a surprise. I did not expect that when I started making this list, but I, I just couldn't help it. It's that good. But anyway, now let's move on to number six, the newest game on the list. In fact, it has only shipped into retail stores in the States within the last week. I think it'll be following, you know, in the rest of the world shortly. So it just barely made it into 2018. In fact, I suspect this might very well make a lot of reviewers best of 2019 because so many reviewers weren't aware that it was coming out. But this is why I always wait. I wait up until the last second. People are constantly, where's your top 10, Rado? Can you get it to us? And I, I wait and wait and wait because there's always a few surprises. And um, I would have hated to leave off the lift list my number six, New Frontiers, uh, the Race for the Galaxy board game. Like I said, it's only just come out, and it is fantastic. Uh, now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you are a diehard Race for the Galaxy fanatic, you must seek this out. It, certainly, it doesn't replace Race for the Galaxy, but it does so many cool and interesting things to the core Race for the Galaxy formula. Really opens it up. And to me, the most important thing it does is it turns what is a more tactical game into a more strategic game. In race, you are often at the whim of your card. All right, there's this particular thing I want, but it's such an endless bottomless deck. I don't know if I'm ever going to find it. Fine. Okay, this is what my exploring gave me. I'll go off and pursue this strategy instead. And that's fine. Don't get wrong. Race is a brilliant game, as is roll, as is jump drive. Um, uh, New Frontiers fundamentally flips that on its head because... All the developments that will ever be in the game you're playing are there right from the get-go. And that means you can, before the game even starts, be making long-term strategic plans for your beginning, middle, and end game. That's, not so, that's something you can hope for. You can make plans in race and hope that those things will come true, but there's no guarantee they'll show up. In this game, you can make those plans knowing that they are viable options to pursue. And that informs you from start to finish. And don't get me wrong, there's still exploration of the galaxy that can still surprise you and push you off in new and exciting directions. It still has that um, that juice, that drive, that excitement that the game is always so much known for. But I gotta say, Jen and I have really enjoyed that extra high level of long-term strategy that is now available to us like never before, which is why it is my number six, New Frontiers. Then, let's move on to number five. 
between two castles of Mad King Ludwig. Certainly the number one on most ridiculous title of the year. Uh, that is because it is a game mashup of Between Two Cities and the Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Instead, it's Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig, and oh my gosh, this is fantastic. For me and Jen, this kills both of its predecessors. Um, because it takes the elements we love from both of them the most and brings them together in a very, very cool mix. Now, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with folks who say, really, this is primarily a variant on Between Two Cities that just happens to have a Castles of, Lu of Mad King Ludwig theme put on top of it. I think that's fair, because I'll be honest, the thing I love most about Castles of Mad King Ludwig is the theme. The crazy, wacky, silly, nonsensical um, castles you can end up creating because you're working for a Mad King. And this game has that, but it has that insanely brilliant core mechanism. While it is a competitive game, I'm trying to make a better castle than you. For the Mad King, you and I are both colluding trying to make an awesome castle. Because I live literally, and you literally, and your opponent literally sits between two castles. One on my left, one on my right. Uh, the one on my right, I am colluding with that player. The one on my left, I am colluding with that player. I have to make sure both of these castles are awesome, and all the other castles are just kind of meh, so that I can come out on top. And Jen and I love that. We are always as Care Bearer players, as coupled gamers who love playing games and love working together, even if we're competing. Um, a game that gives us the opportunity to work together, oh, that is such a welcome breath of fresh air. And that's what this game is from start to finish, because we are always working to try to make this the best. And I also have to say, man, the more I play it, I loved uh, the Automa system that was existing in between two cities, but the new streamlined third-player dummy for uh, co for uh, two, for couples gameplay, for two-player gameplay, is so nice. It just works so well. This game is brilliant. Absolutely adore it. Would happily play it. And then on top of that, like Seven Wonders or other drafting games, it still plays brilliantly at higher player counts and is just so cool and fascinating to watch all these castles evolve every time you play. And the core thing, at the end of it, you will have a castle that is very unique, that tells a story. And it's just it's just a blast. It's my number five. Between the between two castles of Mad King Ludwig. But now let's move on to number four. Gugong. And now, the interesting thing about this is, a lot of the praise that I would heap on Gugong, I have already heaped on Underwater Cities earlier. This is another game that really um, g introduces such a cool and wonderful twist to worker placement, which is that you don't place workers on the board, you have a handful of cards, and you place those cards in the worker placement spots to trigger the actions you need to do in this economic simulation about helping build the Great Wall of China and, and um, you know, seeing to the decrees of the Emperor and all the rest of the kind of stuff you would do in a, uh, in a, in a Euro-style economic simulation. But the fact that this is worker placement and all the workers I've got are constantly constantly shifting throughout the game as I'm getting new works in my hand to give me extra cool bonuses there, special powers. So, um, Underwater Cities did that with a handful of cards that uh, doubled as work placement. So does this. But they both do it in such radically different ways. Underwater Cities, I didn't really go into it too much depth, is the fact that all of your cards are color-coded. So ideally, you want to send a red card to a red slot. And if you want to play this red card because it's so important for you for your combo, um, that means you got to activate, well, you should activate one of the red slots so you can trigger bonuses. Because if you put it in a green slot, oh, or, or, no, or I forget what the colors are. Were they colorblind issues? I don't remember now. But if you put it in a non-color matching slot, you've kind of wasted the bonus of that card, so you don't want to do that. Gugong does something different. Because whenever I'm going to put a worker in a slot, which is again is one of these cards, they represent gifts that I am giving to local magistrates to do the actions I need them to do, whether it's traveling around the world, collecting taxes, or again, building Great Wall of China. Whenever I do that, that's me thematically giving a gift to that local magistrate. And um, because of literally the laws of China at the time, he is required to give me a gift back. Which is to say, I give up one card with a worker power on it, and I take another one back into my hand. That is such a cool 
cool puzzle, especially because when I'm doing this, I always ideally want to give a higher value gift than the one I receive so I can get the full benefit of it without having to pay extra resources and whatnot. Um, the fact that I'm doing that, which means I'm potentially putting workers on the table that you desperately want, that you desperately need, and I know you need it, but I got to do it because of the thing I need to do. Again, it, this is a central theme for me and Jen. Any kind of game that can create interesting and deep and tense interaction between players that isn't about us destroying each other, but instead creating opportunities for each other is so welcome. And Gugong is like that from start to finish. Now, there's another thing. I mean, you might wonder, well, hey, these are both two kind of the same things, just different ways. Why does Gugong come out on top of Underwater Cities? Main thing is, in addition to all that other stuff I just said, it's a much shorter game. Um, I forgot to mention, Underwater Cities, as much as I love it, I wouldn't mind if it were a little bit on the shorter side. It kind of... Uh, I remember how I said it, it kind of has shades of terra, uh, terraforming Mars. Certainly, that's one of the things we don't like about terraforming Mars. It's way too long. I wouldn't mind it if Underwater Seas were just a little bit shorter. Gugong is the perfect leg. It's just a quick in-out hour of really fun, deep, tense Euro goodness. Number four, Gugong. But now, let's move on to number three. My favorite board game designer of all time. He's had a very good year because my number three is Forum Trajanum from designer Stefan Feld. And wow, this is him back at the height of his powers creating a big, wonderful, expansive, broad, um, boisterous, just boiling over with a million different opportunities to pursue a uh, Euro point salad game, which while some people might view that as a put down to me, that is a badge of honor. A game that can give you, the player, so many different avenues, so many different choices, so many different things to pursue, so many different plates to keep spinning, so many different balls to keep in the air while you're juggling. That's what Forum Trajanum does. It's one of the things that Stefan Feld does better than just about any buddy when he's making his big, expansive, heavy, complex Euros, and that's what this is, and it's so great. Uh, and there's a lot of things that are great about it, but there's one thing that puts it over the top, makes it one of his best designs ever. Because it's something he hasn't really ever dealt with much before. But again, it's another example of what I keep talking about. Um, non-destructive, non-violent, non-aggressive player interaction. Because the trick of this game is every round, uh, there's some cards that are going to get played that determines what tile you can pull off your board. Uh, and the more tiles you pull off, that gives you more opportunities to build, gives you more access to special abilities. Um, Every round, you're going to pull two tiles off of your grid, and those two tiles will give you two potential actions you can do this round, right? Here's the thing. I got two tiles. One of them I'm going to potentially use. The other one I have to give to my opponent. I have to give it to you. And at the same time, you must. The two you've got, you must give me one. And that is awesome. Because um, you know, then I'm worrying about, oh, I want to do both of these. This is the one I should really do, but that means I've got to give you this other one, which is perfect for you. It's the exact thing. Should I do this one instead? Um, but you know, even after I make that decision and give you one, you're going to give me something, and that might change everything. Oh my gosh, you gave me this? Am I going to do this or this? From start to finish. And this is a longer game. Uh, not too long, though. Not as long as Underwater Cities. Um, or Teotihuacan, for that matter, or maybe around the same length. Anyway, though, um, but from start to finish, it is just chock-a-block with cool, fun, tense decisions that are always driven as much by what I'm doing as by what you're doing. And that level of interaction is what makes it so special. It's what makes it my number three, Foreign Trajanum. But now, let's talk about number two, Pandemic fall of Rome. Oh, it's Rome, baby! All the time! Uh, you know, Emperor Trajan and Form Trajanum, and now the, the, the final glory days of the uh, Empire, the Republic. Was it an Empire when it fell or a Republic? No, it was a Republic then. Anyway, anyway um, it's great. It is taking the cool core pandemic formula that we still love to bits. Uh, this was the year that the uh, 10th anniversary edition of Pandemic came out, which is also a beautiful thing. I have a video for that up shortly before the end of the month. Uh, so it's it's the 10 year anniversary of Pandemic. And so, yay, we get that cool special um, uh, production of it, but we also get an amazing reimagining of Pandemic where the cubes do not represent viruses running rampant across the world. They represent the invading barbarian hordes trying to tear our empire down. Um, and while we are running all over the map trying to fight them in ways similar to how we've always done in Pandemic, one of the coolest things is 
we can actually get them on our side. We can tell the virus, or the barbarians, you will join us, and now we can actually recruit you to help fight off the other barbarians. Just that, in and of itself, is so cool, because the notion that these cubes, they don't function like traditional pandemic viruses. They don't just sit there and build up and every once in a while explode. Instead, they have migratory patterns that they follow because they're all starting out from their home hinterlands, all trying to work their way towards Rome and sacking cities along the way. We know what path they're going to follow. In regular pandemic, we know what cities are likely to be hit. Now, in this game, we know what migratory paths through the map are likely to be followed. And that means we have a very different approach to how to mitigate risk and take chances and, you know, fight the day. Absolutely adored. And I gotta say, it is such a testament to how strong this design is that it makes my number two in spite of the fact that it has a healthy dollop of roll to resolve dice, which is one of my least favorite things, maybe my single least favorite game board game mechanism, and you do it a fair amount in here. But even still, I like that because it's not just roll dice and see what happens, um, because uh, each of the dice you're rolling have the potential to unlock cool special secret powers the player has. You have interesting choices before you roll based on how many dice you'll roll when you're fighting these particular barbarians, because you don't have to roll all the dice that are available to you. You could take uh, fewer chances at bad things and going lower if you think you have a better shot at beating them, but then you have less chance of unlocking your special powers. So while it's still roll to resolve, I'm still not crazy about that. What um, Matt Leacock, who co-designed this with Paolo More, uh, you know, an incredibly uh, well-respected Euro designer. I mean, hey, he made Vasco da Gama. Come on, got to give it up to the man. What these two have come up with is something absolutely brilliant and incredibly fresh, new, and exciting uh, take on Pandemic, which is the fall of Rome. But that's it, folks. I'm not going to talk about that anymore, but I am going to keep talking about Ancient Rome because my number one game of the year is felled again. And yeah, it's Carpe Diem. Seize the day, everyone! Certainly, Feld seized this year. Two of his best ever games he brought out back to back. And Seize the Day is absolutely amazing. It's interesting. Seize the Day now ranks as my number three best Feld game of all time. Beaten only by Trajan and only by um, uh, Burgundy. And in all honesty, if it weren't for the criminally um, poor raw physical components of this game, there are color identification issues, there's, you know, there's a bunch of different problems with it that makes the game harder to play than it should be. Put, um, that actually kind of pulled it down for me a little bit. It could have rated, it could maybe maybe Eclipse Trajan in the long run because this game is so clean and so pure and so elegant and yet so tense. It is at its heart a tile land game. You have this, this kind of nice little twist on um, drafting where there's a bunch of depots of tiles all around this central board and uh, basically every turn you move your guy to uh, another adjacent space and grab a tile from there. Although there's a really cool twist to that, which is, uh, depending on the circumstances, you don't have to move. You could actually move to a new place or stay where you are, giving you a lot more freedom than you would otherwise have in most uh, drafting games of its ilk. Uh, because it's, it's, strictly speaking, it's a rondelle that just happens to look like a star. There's a whole thing about that. I'm not going to go into that today. But anyway, suffice to say, it is a much more interesting than average draft because of the fundamental cool, bouncing nature of it. I love that. But that combined with the tiling, this is the best tiling I have seen since Santa Maria and Glenmore. Because you are constantly, and, and actually, you know, Forum Trajan had some really great tiling too, but you're constantly presented with this little area you have to build, um, you're grabbing these tiles, hoping to get the ones you want, hoping they won't disappear because they disappear like clockwork, and you're, or you know, like 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 uh, at, at a very high pace, and you're constantly forced to make agonizing decisions. I could get this now, but it's not what I really want. And if I get this and the other one disappears, it would have been a waste of time to get this. Should I go for the surefire one instead? You're constantly making those decisions, but then actually tiling is so full of complexity because of the ways that you can score bonus points off of the band rolls and the uh, side objectives that come out. Uh, you know, the very simple rules that make a very, very deep thing. But Aside from both those, the, the the draft is cool and interesting, unique. The tiling is insanely tense and exciting and fun if you're a Euro fan like me and Jen, in the same way that Santa Maria was or Glenmore is. But 
Those are both great, but what puts it over the top is the bonus objective scoring of this game. Because as part of setup, you lay out a grid of cards that indicate all the different ways you can score bonus, all the objectives. But the thing is, three times over the course of the game, we're going to stop playing and score. Each player is going to score two of those cards that are adjacent to each other. So I might have looked right from the game and said, oh, these two cards are next to each other. I could, you know, for the next few rounds, uh, pursue a strategy that would let me score both of those really nicely. Um, but the problem is, once I've done that, I can never score that particular combination of cards again. And what's worse, uh, based on how turn order plays out, you, if you target that same pair, you might get there ahead of me. And now I could only score one of those two cards. And, I, you know, if, if the two were above and below each other and I was going to score both of these, and, um, oh, yeah, I'm in a low box. You can't see me. Never mind. Um, suffice to say, the I'm doing a terrible job. Watch the run-through itself, folks, because hopefully it demonstrates... Just how insanely cool. This is one of the coolest bonus objective uh, scoring systems I have ever seen. Combined with an awesome tile lane game and a fantastic uh, tile drafting game, three spokes of this wheel that are absolutely amazing puts Carpe Diem in spite of its very, very weak production issues. And by the way, apparently uh, in 2019, it's going to get a second printing, so maybe you want to wait for that one. I don't know. Uh, you know. Hopefully the publisher will release more information about that. I'm hoping they'll be releasing upgrade packs for folks like us who have the first edition. But regardless, even if no edition ever came out, even if I have to take a Sharpie to it to scribble on the tile so I can at a glance tell which is a brown building versus a gold building because they look almost identical, in spite of those issues, it's still my number one game of the year. And I don't see that changing at all. Carpe diem. And that's it, folks. A quick top 10 for you. Um, and again, if you are a backer of my uh, show on Patreon, you can now go on ahead and watch the ramble where I will keep talking about all the other games. The games I had, the games I got rid of, uh, the games I have yet to see, um, you know, etc., etc. Or you can just have a wonderful, wonderful holiday season. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I hope you folks had a great year, and I hope 2019 will be even better for you. Speaking of 2019, uh, come back on January 1st, and I should have up and ready to go my top 10, or will it be a top 10? I'm not sure. I haven't even given it much thought yet. Most anticipated games for 2019. So that's coming soon. But otherwise, folks, I... Uh, I'm just going to say thanks very much for watching. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye.